I wanted to start this message with a simple question. What do you want? Really, what do you want? So I, I'm going to see how clear this is. I think a simple question like that, every one of us should be able to answer, right? So on three, we're all going to yell it out, right? One, two, three, what do you want? Some of you actually answered stuff. I was shocked. <laughs> and here's why I'm shocked, because when I say that, what do I want? What do I want? It's such a difficult question. In what area of my life are you talking about exactly? I'll give you an example. I go to the grocery store. And I can tell you there are things that I want, right? So I'll just, I'll pick on myself a little bit. I want to be healthy. I want to um, lose weight. And I, and I want to take steps in that direction. So as I'm going through the grocery store, you know, I, I put, you know, the Lean Cuisine frozen dinners in there because, you know, they're portion controlled and I make sure I, you know, get ones that I'll actually like and eat or whatever. And, and that's cool. But also, you know, as I'm walking by the cookie aisle, man, do you know they've got coconut Oreos now? <laughs> So, yes, and yes, I want to be healthy, but I also want the coconut Oreos that I was, I didn't get them. They're, they're still on the shelf, but they're still, you know, they're in the back of my mind. I, I want to go back. Um, but you, you walk down the aisle, and there's the aisle with the cakes, and there's the aisle with all these things that are unhealthy. And yes, you have the good stuff in your cart, but you also have the stuff that you probably shouldn't be eating in your cart. And I think life is a lot like that grocery store. You see, there are things that we want in our life. We, you know, we want this life that's holy and pure, and we want to be generous, but... Uh, it's tough to be generous when I, there's really this thing that I wanted. You know, there's a new iPhone out. <laughs> Did you guys know there's a new iPhone out? That it does all kinds of neat little tricks that my current iPhone won't do. So we, we, we kind of, I think we're a lot like these guys. It, tell me if you've ever been like these guys. That's what we want, right? We want to be able to eat Oreos and have six-pack abs, right? <laughs> we, we want it, and not only do we want it from us, but we want it from everybody else. But the problem is, is when we don't know what we want, when we want it all, inevitably we end up with a lot of what we don't want. And that's true in life. That's true in raising our children. That's true in relationships. When we can't figure out the one thing that we want, the one thing that we want, we end up with a whole bunch of garbage that maybe it's good, maybe it's okay, maybe there's nothing wrong with it. Is the best thing that you can say something is that there's nothing wrong with that, there's nothing wrong with that. And so we end up wanting these things, but the things that we want end up keeping us from the one thing that really, really matters. And here is the problem. Our brains have us go after what we want, what we want, what we want, what we want. And it can change in a moment. It really can. It can change in a moment. You know, um, I, I, I can't tell you how quickly that decision can be made. And the best decision I can make in front of some coconut Oreos is to walk away from that aisle. Because if I buy them, then they're sitting in my cabinet and I have to make that decision every time I open the cabinet. Do I eat? Do I not eat? Do I eat? But if I can walk away in the grocery store, it's a lot easier to resist that temptation because I made that decision that that's not something that I want to put in my body in order to... But here's the deal. Why was I able to make that decision? Whatever it is in life, you got to write this down. It's not on your notes, but what must come after why? What must come after why? You see, because if you've got a big enough why, 
There's going to be a lot of what's that are competing. Maybe you, what is your what? Maybe you want your children to grow up and know Jesus personally. So there's a lot of, if you've got that as your major why, there's going to be differences in the way that you raise your children. The what's that you allow in their lives are different if you've got that big why. And we're going to get into the whys in a minute. But here's the reason why why must become before what. Everything that you want can be found in one direction. And that direction is up. Anybody ever ride a bike? Anybody ever ride a bike? What's easier, riding uphill or riding downhill? And if there's ever a moment that you dread on a bike, right, it's that part of the road where it's a long, long upgrade. And sometimes it's just a little upgrade, but if it goes on for miles, it just... It wears you out, right? And life is the same thing. When we've got a great big thing that we have as a life goal, whether that goal is to be healthy, whether that goal is to be wealthy, whether that goal is to be anything that it is that you would desire, maybe you want to be successful, maybe you want to be famous, Maybe you want to be, whatever it is you want to fill in that blank for you. And all of us in this room, however many people are here, I'm sure our what's and our why's differ from between us. But that's what this whole rise up talk is about. It's about figuring out the few things that when you make that why big enough, when that why is big enough, all the other decisions the things that you do with your time, the things that you do with your money, the things that you do with your family, the, the things that you do in life. It's always going to be up. And unless you've got a big enough why, you're going to quit pedaling the bike. You're going to buy them, you're going to buy the Oreos at the store. You're going to quit exercising. You're going to spend money on things you don't really need. You're going to behave in a ways that waste time instead of use your time to become what you want, to do what you want, because your why isn't really big enough. And see, what we want, or why we want what we want, is the fire that makes us rise. Let's say that out loud. Why we want what we want is the fire that makes us rise. It's what keeps that fire in our belly, that, that big white hot why is what, and as I, when I wrote that down, I had this image in my head. We used to have hot air balloons by where we lived and they actually touched down in the field next to us, but they have this, um, this cord on a hot air balloon when they pull the fire goes up inside and then as the fire goes up the balloons rise and our life is very much the same thing if we want to rise we got to figure out the why because the why is what's going to cause us to rise it's going to cause us to let go of everything that's weighing us down and be able to move forward but i think the biggest thing is i wrote this question what is your why what is your why? What is your why? And you remember when I started out the message, I asked everybody to yell it out loud, and I was shocked that I got any answers. Some people were able to answer, but I think they only answered in one area of their lives. And I thought that maybe, just maybe, you might have a trouble figuring out your want for the same reason that I do. And here's the reason. I'm going to draw... If you've seen this before, welcome back to pa Bad Art with Pastor John. Okay, so I'm going to draw some pictures. And, and I'm going to ask that question of what is your why, but also what do you want? And we'll start here. Personally, just you as an individual, what do you want? But that's not the only thing that's encompassing, right? Because we're more than just individuals. Or let's talk about your family. Let's draw 
we'll make some little ones and some not so little ones and let's draw some people and we'll pretend you've got 2.5 kids just like the average American family. Um, I don't know how 0.5, how do you get half of a kid by the way? I, I just, <laughs> I'm not going to pick on Christian from up here, okay? I'm just not. <laughs> Okay, so we got our family. I'm just going to make it two because drawing half a kid would be kind of weird even though it's October and I'm not going to go there. But Okay, so we got our family, personally, family. And then I thought about, you know, here is my house and my neighbor's house and the other neighbor's house. And I thought maybe we would be in a big city. So there's some buildings back here. Okay, so we've got personally, family. Anybody got an idea what that word is? Community. community, yeah. They all end in Y. Okay, and, and then this last one, I, I couldn't think of what to draw. Because you guys all do different stuff. So I, I was thinking occupationally, um, successfully, and I just... I, I could have drawn a, a wrench or a, um, a, a, what do they call those things that go on the, a stethoscope? Or I could have drawn a book or a ruler for those who are teachers, or I could have drawn, so I have no clue. clue. So I, I'm just going to write work. It doesn't end in Y, but it's easier to draw, because I don't know what it is. So you've got all of these areas, and in every one of these areas, who in this room wants to be a success? Right? We, we all want to be success in every one of those areas. Even those of you guys who don't have work, you have school, and that's your job. Bring home A's. Okay? Bring them home. Yes, A's. <laughs> so whatever it is, you've got all these areas that you want to be successful in, and we want to rise up, and sometimes those goals compete against each other, don't they? So if my goal is to spend lots of time with my family so that I can raise them right, there's sometimes this goal of being a lot with your family hurts this goal of being a success at work. And sometimes this can pull away from community and sometimes I'm selfish and I want to be, maybe I want to be the best golf player in the world. No, nah, that's a bad example because I can't even hit a golf ball. Um, <laughs> I can at putt-putt. I'm pretty good at putt-putt. I've gotten a hole in one like three times. <laughs> but um, so whatever it is that you want individually competes with this, competes with this. They all compete against each other, don't they? So how do we get that one white hot why, that, that one decision that makes every other decision? And, and I'm going I'm, I'm to talk a little bit... I don't like being completely narcissistic up here. I like to pull things into your world. The problem is, is I can't get directly into your world right now, but can I invite you into mine? Is it okay if I invite you into mine? Okay. Can I talk to you about my why? What is my why? So all of these things compete with me too. I have the same struggles that everybody else does of trying to balance between individually and family and community and, and work and all these things. They, they, they kind of fight each other and I'm trying to balance it and I'm trying to figure it out and sometimes I get it right, most times I get it part wrong, right? We get, but we fight for this balance. But here's the deal for my why. The why for me is found in the Bible, you see, God gave me this gift of being able to connect people to God. And in, within that gift, I found this verse that kind of tells why. Um, let's read this out loud. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Can I tell you a little bit about the world that we live in? The world of the day today is different than the world of some of you that grew up 
in a different generation. It's vastly different. The way people think, the way people think about God, the way people think about death is vastly, vastly different than the world that you grew up in. Most people my age and younger, let me tell you what they believe. If you ask them, how do you get to heaven? Do you know what their answer is? You die. So the way to heaven is that you simply die. It doesn't matter whether you knew Jesus or not. Well, you probably want to be a good person, but even that's forgiven. We live in a world where we used to have this standard of what was good and what was evil, and now people just do whatever's right in their own eyes. We live in a world where I could stand on this stage and I can preach hellfire and brimstone. And I can tell people, you're going to go to hell if you don't, you know, turn or burn. And I can bang my fist and yell and scream. And eventually, even those who love Jesus will go away because nobody wants to hear that. Right? So here's my white hot why. I believe that the foolishness of preaching will save those who believe. But how do we create a message that those who believe that they don't need to believe in Jesus, they don't need to come to church in order to be saved, how do we reach them? So here's the white hot why. Creating a church that unchurched people love to attend. Creating a church that unchurched people love to attend. Can you say that out loud with me? Creating a church that unchurched people love to attend. Now, why is it that someone who is unchurched, someone who is unsaved, someone who thinks they don't need Jesus to get to heaven, why in the world would they come to church? You know, you have to invest at least an hour to come to church. There, actually, you've got to invest at least two. You know, there's the time to get ready. There's the time to get home. There's the time to um, drive here and there. So it takes a couple hours of some people's only day off during the week is Sunday. And we're asking them to give up two hours of their only day off to come to church. So in order to create a church that people are actually going to attend, we're going to have to create a church... It reaches them where they're at. So maybe you don't like or agree with everything that I do. And maybe, maybe it's for these guys. Maybe playing queen, I want it all, I want it all, and I want it now, isn't, isn't the right thing to do in church based on the way that you grew up. But something we've got to do to make this door wide open every time somebody comes in. I don't know where they came from. I don't know when they'll come. I don't know which Sunday is going to be the Sunday that that someone you've been praying for. You know that someone. That someone who you're not sure if they know Jesus. You know them and you love them and you've invited them to church. You don't know what day they're going to come, but someday they're going to show up. And when they do, our goal is to have a church service that unchurched people love to attend so that they can come back and I don't know if I want to use this language but I'll use it anyway we can get them to come on enough dates with Jesus that eventually they fall in love with Jesus through the foolishness of preaching you know, I don't only do things that are unorthodox. Paul didn't call preaching foolishness when he was talking about himself. He was doing things that were unorthodox. He would, he would preach sometimes so long that somebody would fall, fall asleep and fall out of the rafters and they, they would die and then he would bring them back to life. <laughs> I try to do the shorter 30-minute version. I'm trying, folks. I know you think I'm trying sometimes. It goes way over. <laughs> but through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe in. And today we're talking about the why. 
I definitely invite you to think about my why. The fact that getting people to church, inviting your friends and family to church actually makes a difference. Has anyone ever hoped parts of the Bible aren't true? Yeah. There's things that I read in the Bible and I'm just, God, I hope I misunderstood that. There are people that I love that are no longer with us and I I hope I misunderstood that, God. I hope that they're with you, but I can't do anything for them, but there are people that are still alive and breathing. And, And maybe you should invite them to church. Maybe even if they're unchurched, you know, I've read a statistic um, from Gallup that said that, that 66% of people will come to church if invited by a friend. That's two out of every three people you know. If you simply invite them to church, they would come, statistically. And God's chosen to save them through the foolishness of preaching. So how do we do that? How do we create, how do we create church services or a church place that people love to attend? And I submit to you it's by trying to make everything here excellent. We call them irresistible environments. We try to make, we try, we're trying to get everything to be as good as possible. Nothing is exactly where I want it. I think as a leader, we're never satisfied. Is there anybody here who's never satisfied? I'm just not. I'm never satisfied. It's never going to be good enough for me. I'm always going to be my toughest critic. I'm always going to try to make everyone around me better. But whenever someone comes, I want them to be engaged by the music, be engaged by everything that happens in the service, to be engaged by our wonderful children's ministry, to be, make, make things be easy and make people want to come. I fight for it and, and I strive for it. And during the message, I believe my job isn't just to communicate what the Bible says. The reason I'm going to get back to this message of rise, I'm I'm going to stop my why, and I'm going to show you what happens when you invite Christ into your why. What happens when you invite Christ into every one of these situations where you want to rise personally and family and community and occupationally. What happens when you invite him? You know, when I was doing these four, I was like, God, I, I, I know, I, you know, God, you guys, I think visually. I see a picture in my mind and I draw it. It's way better in my mind, by the way. <laughs> but I so desperately wanted a box on here to be church. And God wouldn't let me put it there. God would not let me put the box for church. And here's why I wanted the box for church, because I wanted to talk to you guys about volunteering at church and how when you give to church and all these things about church. And it's a different message. It's not this week. And here's why God wouldn't let me do it. The box look a little different now. That box look a little different now. You see, he wants us to invite the cross into every single area of our lives and watch it be revolutionized. The cross into our personal life. The cross into our family life. The cross into our community life. The cross into our occupational life. He wants us to invite the cross into it all. And why is it simply so that It'll all become Jesus fied. No. It's actually for our own benefit. You see, Jesus makes everything better. Look at you, somebody near you and just tell them Jesus makes everything better. He makes everything better. He makes your personal life, your family life, your work life, your community life. He makes them all better. And this is Jesus' own words I'm going to put up. Let's read these words. They're the red words. Let's read them next. It's Jesus in his own words out of the book of Luke. Let's read it out loud. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring 
good news to the poor. Well, I'm going to stop right there. Good news to the poor. Where are you feeling poor? Is family life poor right now? Is work life poor right now? Is community life poor right now? Is your individual life poor right now? Is your health poor right now? Is your finances poor right now? Is your relationship with your children poor right now? Is your marriage poor right now? Jesus says he has been anointed to preach good news to the poor. I'm poor, Jesus. I need good news. Anybody else? Anybody else willing to be broken enough before Jesus to say, I need some good news. Good news. Jesus makes everything better. Let's read on. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. Captives will be released. Anybody ever felt bound and captive in any one of these? Anybody been in a dead-end job and you don't see a way out? You can't quit, but you can't go on, but you keep going on because you have to go on because you've got to pay the bills. And Anybody felt captive in a sin, felt captive in shame, felt captive in guilt in your own personal life? Have you ever felt captive inside your community? I feel captive all the time. I push my garage door and I open it and I back up and I drive away and I come home and I push my garage door opener and I close it behind me. Why? It's like we're in a prison in our own house sometimes within our community. It's like we want to break out and affect the community, but we feel like they don't even want us to come knock on their door. They don't even want us to walk across the street. Sometimes it becomes so awkward when you reach out to your neighbors. I don't know if it's like that where you live, but everywhere I've lived, it's kind of like, uh, you almost feel captive. But Jesus says he's come to proclaim that captives will be released. I don't know where you're at with your faith, but inviting the cross into work can sometimes become very difficult. You can feel like you're captive, like there's not a way. But, you know, I've seen this in my own life. At my old job, when I was in a secular world, I was there for five years, and I was, you know, kind of left trying to be under the radar. Anybody ever try to be under the radar with your faith? Like, you don't want the boop. But as I started just getting on fire for God, I found that I didn't even have to go to people. People started coming to me and they're like, John, my dad's dying. Can you pray for me? I wasn't a pastor. I, was, I went to church. But Suddenly the Lord began to open these doors, open these doors. And the more that I invited Christ into my workplace, it was a crazy thing. But the more successful I became. I actually started making more and more money after I brought my head out of the... And I don't know why. It wasn't, I can't explain it other than that God showed up. That's the only way I can explain it. The only thing I, way I can explain is that Jesus makes everything better. And I don't know if you can break through and have that intentional conversation with somebody that you go across the street and, and you shake somebody's hand. Maybe the neighbors are moving in and you're able to help them carry a couch. I don't know what it is that you can do, but I promise you, if you figure out a way to just help people and be there for people, do what you can for people, sooner or later it's going to open a door of the gospel that they'll be like, what's different about you? What's different about you? So that the captives will be released and that the blind will see. I think every one of us are walking around blind. We're walking around blind in every one of these areas and that's why God's having me preach this message called Rise. God wants us to figure out how to not be blind to what the truth is. Sometimes we're blind on purpose. You know, I wrote a song one time, and the opening line says, I walk through life with blinders on. It was, I wrote that song back in those years when I worked at the, at the Dodge store, and I, and I wasn't really trying to be public with their faith. Why don't you want to be public in your faith in car sales? Because people are asking you to compromise it all the time. Have you ever been to a car dealership? 
But the more I went public with my faith, no, I'm not going to tell them they got something different on their trade than what you're actually giving them on their trade. I'm not going to tell them that they're getting this price when they're getting that price. I'm not going to lie in order to make a buck. Why won't you do that, John? Because I'd have to compromise what I believe. And suddenly, more successful, more successful, more successful. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? That people actually want to buy a car from someone they can trust. Wow, what a revelation. (laughs) Do you want to go to a car dealer where you can buy a car from someone you can trust? Because you really can't. Okay, so anyway, that the oppressed will be set free. And I don't know if you have oppression in any one of these areas where you feel like, God, I need to be set free, but this is your day. This is my day. I don't know if this is your day. Do you, is it your day? You better say, this is my day. Because he's here and he wants to set you free. And he wants to deliver you from the things that oppress you. He wants to deliver you from your fears. He wants you to invite Christ into every single area of life. And let's close. This is the very next verse. It says, let's read this out loud. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So this is, does this mean I need to wait till next week? See, Jesus spoke these words 2,000 years ago to those of us who would believe. Through those of us who would believe by the foolishness of preaching that Jesus actually is who he said he was and that he makes everything better and the time of the Lord's favor has come. Next week, we're going to start learning about, you see, I talked about the what and the why today. And I'm going to finish up talking about the what and the why. But is there anybody who wants to know how? Oh, you're going to have to come back next week and find out how. You're going to, I, I'm not going to keep you here for an hour and a half preaching this message. You're going to have to come back next week and find out how. But we're going to, we're going to finish up the what and the why. And we're going, to, we're going to ask the same two questions we asked before. And we're going to add one more. Let's read these out loud. What do you want? What is your why? And what are you doing? What are you doing with your life that's causing you to not be able to achieve your whys because there's little wants that eat at all of your whys? It's unwise to keep doing the things that keep you from living your why. I'm going to leave this up, but I'm going to read. I'm just... The other thing that I found about these whys... One is too small a number to wrap a Y around. Somebody look at somebody and say, one is too small a number. Do you know what that means? That if my Y is all about this one, I want to be rich, I want to be successful, I want to be healthy, I want to, I want to be all those things, right? Right? I want to be famous. I want to fill in the blank. Whatever your I, 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 I want. It's never going to cause you to be able to keep climbing that hill when stuff gets hard if it's only about you. Your why has to expand to include other people. Imagine a world where we find our purpose in helping others. Find theirs. Imagine a world where we find our purpose in helping others find theirs. And that's why I'm up here. That's why that's my why. That's why I talked about it. Because that is my purpose. I want to help you transform your world. And every single week when I come here, I promise as long as God gives me something, because I got nothing without him, But over and over again, he keeps giving me stuff. If you will apply it, will transform your world. 
transform your world. If you'll apply it, you'll be better. You'll be more successful. You'll go farther with him than you will on your own. And you'll bring other people along with you. Is what, that's what makes the journey fun. That's what makes it worth something. That's what makes it worth fighting for. And when we quit fighting for others, we just want it over if it's just all about us. We just give up. So look up, want up, rise up, and change your world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, even right in this room, I ask you to begin to help us see the why in every area. That you would help us to bring that life of love and sacrifice, Jesus, that you have taught us in the way that you live. So that we would live a life of love and sacrifice in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities. Lord, so that we would give our lives to help others. That we would give our lives that we might see life. That we might find that in doing things your way, we find that we actually prosper in everything we do. Help us to let go of all the little things that stand in the way of all the big things that you want to do through us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.